Welcome to a special bonus presentation of Locked On NHL. I'm Ross Levitan, joined by Mike DiStefano, my regular Wednesday co-host on the Locked On NHL podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On today's special edition of the show, we'll lay out the single most interesting thing about each team in the Eastern Conference going into the 2023-24 NHL season, as outlined by the local hosts of the Locked On NHL Network. We've got impact players dominant storylines, and what's at stake for all 16 teams in the East. And for the full rundown of the five things you need to know about each every NHL team, be sure to watch the 2023-24 NHL season preview playlist on the Locked On NHL channel. And with that, Ross, uh, let's dive into the most interesting thing about every single team we got in the Eastern Conference. And where better to start with the defending Eastern Conference champions, the Florida Panthers, fresh off a run to the Stanley Cup final. But uh, do the Panthers have any shot in hell in getting back without Sergei Bobrovsky once again? Uh, assuming the superhero from last year, uh, he was unbelievable in the postseason. Uh, Armando Velez details why Bob's simply must carry over his postseason play uh, into this season for the Panthers to recapture that magic. Who figures to be the most important player on the Panthers this season and what makes them so critical to the team's success? It has to go to the $10 million man in Sergei Bobrovsky. And l listen, the, the, the Panthers, when they signed Sergei Bobrovsky on July 1 of 2019, the, there was a lot of questions on giving him that amount of money for the set for the seven years. But the Panthers are already halfway through that deal. For, and this was the last two seasons for Sergei Bobrovsky had been his best Rent, franchise single season record in wins in a regular season with 39 in the president's trophy winning season has a 901 save percentage in the in the regular season in 2023 but then really exploded through through the postseason with a 915 save percentage and that's where he had games where he gave where the Florida Panthers gave up seven goals in game two of the Stanley Cup final which Sergei Bobrovsky was was pulled after the fourth one and then nine goals in game five of the Stanley cup final as well, but really, really exploded throughout the second and third round to really be the, the leading front runner for the Florida Panthers in, in as far as cons, my favorite through the first three rounds. But the question is, is that going, is that performance going to be the same going into this regular season? Alex line is no longer in the mix for the Florida Panthers after hit, after he signed a deal with the Detroit Red Wings, Alex line was, a, a good reason why the Florida Panthers made this run to to the postseason to begin with, and Spencer Knight is back from the Players Assistance Program, and Sergey Bobrovsky is a year away from his no move clause becoming a 16 team no trade clause as well for the Panthers. So this is a very important season for Sergey Bobrovsky as far as continuing to build on what he did in the Stanley Cup playoffs this past season. Thanks to Armando Velez for more from him. You can locked on Florida Panthers wherever you get your podcasts, including on YouTube. Now with the Florida Panthers, interesting note, they were second in the NHL last year for most goals by a defenseman. They had 53, only the Carolina Hurricanes with 59 had more. So they get offense from their back end. But do you agree with Armando that they're going to need to help out Sergei Bobrovsky in their own zone just as much if they want to have a successful year? 1,000%. You saw when that guy's cooking, that's a completely different hockey team, right? When he wasn't playing well, they weren't even in a playoff spot. It had to be the Lion King who came through and clutched late in the season for them. And then he found his game and obviously brought it all the way to the cup final. Obviously, Kachuk is going to be a big part. But they're dealing with some injuries on the blue line, too. So it'll be interesting to see if they can kind of weather the storm the first month or two until they get, uh, I think, Montour and Ekblad both dealing with some injuries. So it should be interesting to see uh, how this team can kind of get through the first couple of months for, for Florida. And that Stanley Cup hangover isn't always just the team that hoists it. Going through the rigors of four rounds can you know leave a mark injury-wise on any team. How about the team that the Panthers started their miraculous run to the Stanley Cup Finals with? The Boston Bruins. They're coming off their best regular season and the best one the NHL's ever seen. But they also seem primed for regression after the departures of the now-retired Patrice Bergeron and David Krejci. So what's Boston's plan to replace them down the middle? Ian McLaren of Locked On Bruins has more. So the storyline, I think, for me and others outside of Boston, we know that Patrice Bergeron retired after such a glorious career, and David Krejci soon followed after 
who's who's down the middle right now at training camp with the Bruins? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the Bruins in net and on defense, I would say they're still one of the better teams around the NHL. But if you look at them just uh, in terms of center depth, you would struggle to see them as a as a playoff team with Charlie Coyle and Pavel Zaka now penciled in as the top two centers. Uh, those guys did play pretty well in those roles in games one through four against the Florida Panthers in the playoffs, but a really small sample size. And uh, there's very real questions about whether those two guys can carry the load in the top six over an 82 game season, much less through a, a long playoff run. Uh, they brought in Morgan Geeky uh, as well from Seattle, who's penciled in to play on the third line. Going to be relying on some younger guys, maybe in the fourth line. Um, I mean, best case, perhaps they're able to acquire a bona fide top six guy sometime before the trade deadline and bump Coil back down to the third line or Zaka to the wing where they're perhaps a bit better suited. But yeah, that's going to be a huge question for the Bruins all season long. It's going to be interesting without uh, Bergeron in the fold, Krejci to a little bit of a lesser extent, but certainly the lack of center depth that this team has always had is, is going to be a big time uh, difference from the teams in the past decade decade and a half almost when you look at how strong this club has been so it'll be interesting to see how the boston bruins can uh, rebound after their big time season uh sticking in the loaded atlantic division my toronto maple Leafs broke through finally won a series last year against the tampa bay lightning uh only to get law wiped out by the panthers in five in round two after a change in GM, Sheldon Keefe, he got an extension, but they decided to run it back with the boys on the ice. Uh, here is my co-host of the Locked On These podcast, Dave Morissuti, on whether or not it's it's conference finals, cup or bust. What's going on with Dave and the Leafs? Oh, really looking forward to seeing what they have for an encore after winning a round in the postseason. What's a successful season? I know if you ask just... You know, Joe from Scarborough or, you know, Matt from Markham. It's always the Stanley Cup. But is that a realistic goal this season for the Toronto Maple Leafs? I mean, they finally won a round. It's always going to get tougher to make it as far as you want to go. And the division's going to get tougher. The road to get there is going to be tougher. But this is a team that should have aspirations to at least reach the conference finals or the cup final. I feel like the problem in past years was it's always been the cup final rather than let's win one round at a time. So I think really get yourself, you got yourself to round two. Now you got to get yourself to round three. That should be the focus and then see if you can get, you know, further than that for this Leafs team, you know, walk, some say walk before you can run. They've been walking a little too slow lately. They got to really start showing some progress. I, I want to see this team get to the conference final and, and break out and get to that cup final. But Let's let the conference final be the main goal right now. You can always listen to Locked On Maple Leafs wherever you download your podcast. Also free and available on YouTube. Dave and Mike do a great job over with that other team in Ontario. But Mike, is that a fair assessment, do you think, from Dave? You know, just focus on the task at hand rather than the the ultimate goal? Well, that's what they say, right? In the locker room, take a one game at a time, one day at a time, a series at a time, and then uh, hopefully the wins follow. And I think for sure, when you look at a big picture, though, it's a team that uh, is in a window to win a Stanley Cup. So I think that's absolutely, when you're looking big picture, I think it is almost, you know, let's let's get to ourselves in a long playoff run. Cup or bust is probably a, a good assessment of, you know, how the Maple Leafs feel uh, they need to do this year. Well, the Maple Leafs window will at least stay open for another four years after Austin Matthews signed an extension. But in Pittsburgh, there might be even more need to get it done sooner rather than later. The Penguins were one of the busiest teams this summer. They brought in Kyle Dubas from the Toronto Maple Leafs, and then they started mopping up Ron Hextall's mistakes, bringing in three-time Norris Trophy winning defenseman Eric Carlson. Hunter Hodes details how Dubas and Carlson have given the ageless aging penguins more life. Now there were a few of them, but what would you say was your team's most significant offseason move and why? On the ice, that's Eric Carlson. The penguins really didn't have to bring it, give up much to get him, to be honest. It was a classic 
give up all of your bad players for that one good player. And Kyle Dubas was able to do that masterfully. Now the Penguins have two number one defensemen at their disposal for this upcoming season. Chris Letang and Eric Carlson are going to probably be on the ice for 80 to 85% of every game. The bottom pairing will take up that other 15 to 20%. They'll play like those 9 to 10, 11 minutes. And then Eric Carlson and Chris Letang, they'll play those 25, 26 minutes a night. That is by far the biggest move. It's going to help their offense a lot. Yes, the top six is going to be counted on to score a lot of goals, but you can throw Carlson in there too because he's going to drive quite a bit of offense when he is on the ice. Off the ice, that is Kyle Dubas, the new president of hockey operations and general manager. It's probably not new. He was hired back in June. We're recording this just before the season starts, so it's been a little over you know, three to four months at this point since he was brought in, and he has changed the Penguins up in so many ways. On and off the ice, he's built a very robust front office. He's made a lot of moves to the bottom six, defense, brought back Tristan Jari, all this good stuff. And he is shaping this team in his image. And I think right now this team is better heading into the season than it was last season. Those were the two big moves. And that's the Pittsburgh Penguins, man. Mikey, it's going to be probably one of the most fascinating teams to watch in the NHL this season. Yeah, do you think that uh, the bounce back from Carlson is sustainable? I think that's going to be key. I mean, they brought him in to be the guy he was a season ago, but you think back to where he was you know, almost as little as two years ago, wasn't nearly the same player he was last season. I'm curious if he can continue to play like a Norris caliber defenseman going forward. My biggest question mark there is we've seen this once before. When he got to San Jose, Brent Burns was the no doubt number one offensive defenseman, and it didn't seem to jive. It's not a coincidence, in my opinion, that Carlson's best year offensively was after Brent Burns had moved on to Carolina. So now with yeah. Chris Lang, it almost feels like you've got two similar defensemen. I, I just want to know how it works. I usually prefer to have maybe a little more of a yin yang where you have the offensive guy, the defensive guy as your top two, but. It'll be interesting to see how it works with these two being pretty much a carbon copy of one another stylistically. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I probably would give the nod to Carlson. Latang's dealt with a lot of injuries of late and health issues um, that's, you know, maybe seen his game take a bit of a dip. So well, I think that's another reason why they want to bring in EK65, hopefully to shore up that blue line. We'll be locked on to Pittsburgh Penguins all season long. You can too by subscribing wherever you download your podcast and on YouTube. From teams that are aging with their window championships, maybe smidging a little bit closer, we've got two teams and more coming up who are just starting to step in to theirs. The New Jersey Devils, the Buffalo Sabres, and more next. You're listening to Locked On NHL. Indeed is Indeed. Sponsoring the Locked On NHL channel. What is Indeed? Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills. You can do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. If you hate waiting... Well, Indeed understands. Their U.S. data shows that over 80% of Indeed employees find quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job post. With Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor it, you'll get a short list of quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description, and you can invite them to apply right away. Indeed does the hard work for you. Sponsor a job, and boom, Instant Match shows you candidates whose resumes on indeed fit your job description immediately after you post so join the over 3 million businesses worldwide that use indeed to hire great talent fast indeed knows when you're growing your own business you have to make every dollar count indeed also knows that finding people with the right skills makes all the difference when you're hiring a team of one indeed knows that hiring needs to be cost effective and you're running your own business you know that you need to do everything for your company. So visit indeed.com slash locked on to start hiring now. Go to indeed.com slash locked on, indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need indeed. Welcome back to the Locked On NHL podcast, the season preview edition. And what better way to come out of break than with one of the most exciting offensive 
teams in the National Hockey League. It's the New Jersey Devils who took a quantum leap last year from outside of the playoff picture to outside of the second round, getting past their Hudson River rivals in the New York Rangers. They, their summer included a savvy trade with the Calgary Flames to bring in Tyler Toffoli and a long-term deal for deadline acquisition Timo Meyer. For Trey Matthews of Locked On Devils, the time for the Devils to ascend to true contender status is right now. Trey, what's the biggest storyline surrounding the Devils as we get ready for the new season? I'd say the biggest storyline for them is to try to build on their already successful uh, 2022-2023 season because that was a historic year for them in which they broke the franchise record for most wins and they had a successful playoff run. They got up uh, past the first round against the New York Rangers, but now can they repeat it? Obviously, it's hard to top a historic season, but can they maintain the consistency of now being a playoff caliber roster because they're no longer the underdogs. They are fully expected to go back to the playoffs and try to uh, continue to do what they did from last season. So I'd say the biggest storyline is just can they remain that uh, consistent and try to rack up the wins and see themselves back into the Stanley Cup playoffs? And this time, can they actually be legitimate Stanley Cup contenders? I mean, I think that this the, the, the East runs through New Jersey this year, Ross, and, and I have been a believer of this team for a couple of seasons now. Last year, they finally made that jump, and I think this year they're serious Stanley Cup contenders. I think they're well, like almost nearly undefeated at this point through the, the, the preseason, so they're getting off to quite the hot start. Can the goaltending keep up, though? I think that is one of the things that a lot of people are going to be curious about. Speaking of goaltending, it's also a big question mark for the next team that we're going to discuss, and that is the Buffalo Sabres. Last time they made an appearance in the Stanley Cup uh, playoffs was 2011. That's the longest streak in the NHL and type of longest postseason drought in major men's pro sports with uh, the New York Jets, who very, very tortured fan base. Uh, is this the year for Buffalo? For Joe DiBiase to lock on Sabres? It better be. What was the biggest storyline surrounding the Sabres during this season right now as we get ready? So going into it, I mean, really the biggest storyline is can they end the NHL's longest playoff drought in history? And I think they really fired up those expectations yesterday. I think fans loved hearing Kevin Adams, the general manager, Don Granato, the head coach, and Kyle Poso, the captain, as they opened training camp all openly talk about how it is time to make the playoffs, that they are not running from expectations. They are not afraid to say the words playoffs this year. I think that shows that they are secure, by the way, in their jobs um, and where they are as a f franchise, that they feel confident enough to talk about it. But that really is the story is, okay, you've had some nice development, but now it's time for results. That show to be assy locked on Buffalo Sabres. You can get that wherever you get your podcast. It's all going to come to Devin Levi in goal. 21 years old, the most wins by a goalie under 22, 30-ish. I believe it was Matt Murray back in 2016-17. And he already had a Stanley Cup ring by the yeah. time he played his rookie regular season in the National Hockey League. I love the prospect. I think Levi is going to have a fantastic NHL career. But to me, the Buffalo Sabres, with the stacked prospect pool that they have, really missed by not going out there and getting at least on a short-term deal a uh, legit number one option in goal. Yeah, and there's still time to do it, right? If they really are serious about ending that playoff drought, like Joe said, maybe you do put a phone call into the, the Winnipeg Jets and try and, you know, get Connor Hellebuck out of there and get yourself that true number one goaltender. It'll be interesting to see if they do make a move uh, between the pipes at some point this season. They... They had Craig Anderson last year as kind of a stopgap. I think they need Uko Pekalukanen to take a huge step if they are going to get in to the contender status. Because it's one thing to end this playoff drought. It's another thing to be a true contender like the next team we have on the docket. The New York Rangers. Mike, we've spent a lot of time last season. We're going to again this year talking about the New York Rangers. Because when you have arguably the best goalie in the National Hockey League, a Hart Trophy finalist, not this year, but last, and a guy who is a perennial Vesna candidate in Igor Shosturkin, you're going to be at the top of the standings. That's been the case for the New York Rangers, but they haven't been able to get it out of the postseason 
this last year after a conference finals run two years ago. They bowed out to the New Jersey Devils, and it got Gerard Gallant fired. Can Peter Laviolette, a no stranger to the back of an NHL bench, get a talented Rangers team back among the East Upper Crest contenders? John Chick lays out the case for that, why that might just happen. What do you think is the biggest uh, story surrounding the Rangers as we head into training camp and the season ahead? Yeah, to me, there's two, and they're kind of connected, and I'll I'll explain how momentarily here. But I think the first one of those two is, uh, you know, obviously a new coach in Peter LaViolette. The Rangers, two years ago, had that awesome run under Gerard Gallant, and then obviously a very, very disappointing and uh, premature end of their season this past year. Uh, They bring in Peter LaViolette, who's kind of a fiery, no-nonsense coach, and they're trusting him to get them to that next level. And I I think the other thing, and this, again, kind of goes hand-in-hand with the hiring of LaViolette, is trying to get those young players, you know, specifically Kako and Lafreniere, even Philip Heedle to a lesser extent, you know, Heedle had a, a mini breakout season, but I think there's, there's more in the tank for him as well. And um, yeah, just, just going to be an interesting situation. You know, will all or some of those guys play in the top six? Will they be a part of the power play? Uh, if they're not in the top power play unit, will they get more time on the ice on the second power play unit? Uh, there's a lot of different ways it can go. Do you want to move Lafreniere to the right wing? So um, you know, LaViolette, he has had success with uh, young players in the past. You go back and look at the rosters of some of the teams that he's taken to the finals. And a lot of them had some young players who, you know, either went on to have great careers or in some cases still having great careers. And so I think that's encouraging. And it's one of the things that kind of sold me a little bit on LaViolette this this offseason because I was a little bit so-so. I'm used to seeing him uh, coach other Metro Division teams, including your Islanders, Gil. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, um, I, I'm starting to warm up to him a little bit. And like I said, uh, he's he's going to be charged with getting this team to the next level. And uh, certainly those those young players, you know, helping them take the next step forward as well. Those are our Rangers, Ross. You and I on the Locked On NHL podcast have been believers of this team for a couple years now, and they've yet to put it all together. Is this the year that the young kids take that next step? What do you think? Can Lavi get the young kids to buy in? Kako uh, and Lafreniere, can those two take the next step this year and really help put this team over the top. That's the X factors for me. Cause you know what you're yep. going to get in goal. You know, you have a number one defenseman in Adam Fox, Gondre Miller's proving to be every bit as good of the top pair defenseman, but what kind of <laughs> secondary <laughs> offensive attack can they get behind the top line of Mika Zibanejad or Temi Panarin? And well, whether it's Chris Kreider or we could see Blake Wheeler play Blake big Wheeler. Role. As well, an eight hundred thousand dollars, and I am expecting over fifty points from Blake Wheeler. But yeah, for this team to reach the level it wants to, being a cup contender, Alexi Lafreniere needs to take the next step in his career. Thirty-nine points, a career high, mind you, last season, but zero points in seven playoff games. Now, can that? If I if if I gave you an over under really quickly on Laffy's season, and I tell you, so last year career high, thirty-nine points in eighty-one games. If I set the number at 54 and a half, what are you doing? I'd go under. I was, I was struggling at 50 and a half. So 50. Really? So you're you're not high on Laffy having his big breakout. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, he's kind of got to prove it to me for me to, to be a full believer believer. And then you look at it as well, the way that it's set up right now, he does have an opportunity to succeed. He's been skating with Mika Zibanejad and Chris Kreider in training yeah. camp. So I think they're going to give him every opportunity to succeed. And that's why I, I almost hesitated, but until he proves it, I just, I don't know, man, I haven't seen enough consistency at the NHL level. Well, from uh, a team that hasn't been able to get it done over the last few years to a team that has in the Tampa Bay Lightning, uh, it's been a different preseason for them, though. Some may say they've been the losers of preseason so far in the East. You've got Steven Stamkos talking about uh, the weirdness going on with his future in doubt in Tampa Bay. Hasn't gotten a contract extension. Andre Vasilevsky's out for the first couple of months of the regular season. Uh, here's what Locked on Lightning's Adam Denker makes of the significant injury for a team whose window might be starting to close here. Adam, what's the biggest storyline surrounding the Lightning entering this season? Well, the biggest story now, Gil, actually announced today, right before we recorded, that Andre Vasilevsky will miss the first two months of the season after getting uh, a hernia removed in his back. So that's obviously going to dominate the Lightning uh, for the first two months. Now, they do have some good goaltending talent. Hugo Anamafelt will probably be up, be up at the NHL 
uh, level to help out. But yeah, uh, Vasilevsky missing out on the first two months. That's going to be in, an interesting test for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, trying to get back to the Stanley Cup final. Ooh, that's a tough one because they've had so much success recently, but I don't know how they're going to battle through. I appreciate his optimism about what's left in the goaltending pipeline in Tampa. I don't see it that way. I think if Tampa wants yeah. to be serious, they need to get a goalie before the regular season. 100%. And like, there's a lot of options out there. You know, here in Toronto, we keep talking about how Martin Jones would be kind of a perfect solution for that problem that they have in Tampa, a, a you know league minimum goalie who has been a starter in the past. You might be able to get a solid, you know, a couple of months, string together some games and stay afloat because it's the, the start is going to be key for this Tampa Bay Lightning team. You look at this division they've gotten significantly better uh, over the course of the last couple of seasons you know this is the year we're expecting buffalo to take the jump we're expecting ottawa to take the jump and maybe detroit could be a little bit better as well so you know there's a lot of teams that'll be looking to uh to make them basically look at this injury and they're salivating licking their lips thinking if we can get some points early put tampa in a bind you know, maybe it's there's an opportunity here for an extra playoff spot if Vasilevsky's, uh, you know, injury lingers even when he does get back and they don't get full on all world goaltending until the new year. Could be an opportunity for a team to take advantage in that division. Andre Vasilevsky, one of the rare NHL goalies that consistently plays 60 or more games. He has 60 starts this past season, 63 the year before, and it's also the first year in a long time that he doesn't have a veteran behind him. Brian Elliott has yeah. moved on. Jonas Johansson is the scheduled backup for now in Tampa. Now, when you looked at the off season for the Carolina hurricanes, I don't think anyone would have thought, Hey, they need more elite defensemen. They already have Jacob Slavin, <laughs> Brett Pesci. The list goes on and on with Brent Burns in the mix as well. But what did Carolina do? They went out and landed the biggest defenseman on the market, signing Dmitry Orlov to a two-year deal with a cap hit just under $8 million per. But as Jared Ellis from Locked On Hurricane says, it's still Jacob Slavin that makes the deepest blue line in hockey tick. So I always find the Hurricanes interesting because they're a team that's built on the sum of its parts. They don't necessarily have that one player who has 20 more points than everybody else. Everyone plays a role. But to you, Jared, who is the most important member of the Hurricanes for them to have a successful upcoming season? Well, like you said, you know, they are some of their parts. Everyone has their role and everyone plays it really well. But I tend to always go back to the same guy when this kind of question gets answered or gets asked, excuse me. And I got to say Jacob Slavin, you know, because he is the best defensive defenseman in the NHL. He does not get a lot of recognition. He's not a super flashy player. He doesn't put up a bunch of points. But what he does defensively to stop the opposing team is absolutely unreal. And whenever he's out, whether it be injury or whatever, it is extremely, extremely noticeable. Holes that he it tends to cover up or mistakes that he covers up they get brought to the forefront because he plays such a big role on this team. Jacob Slavin, one of the best defensemen in the National Hockey League. You could argue the top shutdown defenseman in all of the NHL. And certainly he's been a big part of that blue line and a big part of, you know, why Rod the Bot has had this team, you know, in the playoffs for so many years and consistently being one of the cup contenders. You think this could be the year, though, for the Carolina Hurricanes? I feel like every year you could say that the last few. So they, they were much like the Toronto Maple Leafs in terms of getting over a hump. They hadn't got out of the second round. They battle that demon and then they can't get past the Florida Panthers. Rod Brindamore will be quick to tell you they did not get swept. They only yep. lost in four games. But wasn't a sweep. If you watched it, the game, wasn't a sweep. Wasn't a sweep. Call it what you want. I'll call it a sweep. And now they have to figure out what was holding them back. I think they just ran into the wrong team at the wrong time. I think if they run it back, they have every good of a chance as anyone else. And FanDuel, our, our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook would agree, they're the NHL's favorite to win the Stanley Cup going into the season. There you go. And they added Michael Bunting. So that's the missing element, potentially. <laughs> no, like hey. for a long time, the missing element in Ottawa was an owner that wanted to invest in the team. But now... 
along with an exciting forward group, a full season of Jacob Chikrin, and brand new starting goalie, Eunice Corpusalo, wearing the greatest goalie mask in Sens history. Brandon <laughs> Piller details that it's actually Michael Anlauer that has Sens fans feeling hopeful for the future. What is the biggest storyline surrounding the Ottawa Senators this season? Well, Seth, uh, for me, the biggest storyline surrounding the Ottawa Senators this season is new ownership. Like in the NHL, new ownership doesn't come around very often. The Senators um, sold for $950 million to Michael and Lauer, the biggest NHL team sale ever, re- ever recorded. That surprised everyone. And Michael and Lauer comes in here with pedigree and the hope that this franchise will finally have some stability as far as ownership goes. He has a championship in the OHL with the Hamilton Bulldogs. He was a minority owner with the Montreal Canadiens. He said he's glad, or his wife said she's glad to get rid of all his Habs stuff, and Sens fans were glad to hear that too. He's officially an Ottawa Senators fan and owner. And just in his press conference, he hit on a lot of the right stuff. The new arena is going to be focused on the fans. He's going to be focused on bringing stability to the ice. And he's already added in some additions to this front office, uh, bringing in the analytics team, uh, bringing back a lot of uh, people that have had success in the Ottawa Senators organization as far as management and executives go. So really, this is the beginning of a new era for Ottawa Senators fans, as we're hoping that with a new owner with clear goals on bringing a better team on the ice and engaging fans more will bring much more stability and make this team fun to root for again. And since that was recorded, they've expanded the front office even further, hiring Steve Steos as president of hockey operations. Steos got his start in management after a NHL career that spanned over a thousand games with your Toronto Maple Leafs, Mikey. And it's always seemed like his name in the last couple of years was coming up as one of those next guys who was going to take a step. Yeah. Uh, the big thing with this team, as you very well know, covering this team uh, on a daily basis is in the first six weeks are going to be so important for this club. You look at the last three years, they dug themselves way too deep of a hole to climb out of it. Uh, this year, they can't afford to do the same because with new ownership, comes definitely new expectations and if things don't go well in the first six to eight weeks of the season I'd imagine there could be some changes afoot Ross yeah and it seems right now that uh, Pierre Dorian is taking on the day-to-day operation Steo Stead in his most recent uh, media availability that he's just kind of watching right it's almost like hey here's the rope like do what you want with it it's your decision right now and there's two major ones that are going to happen soon Shane Pinto is one of only a couple RFAs still unsigned. And what makes that even more peculiar as a 21 year old that's scored 20 goals, 35 points last year as a rookie is he had to play in the top six last year because Josh Norris missed the whole year due to injury after a 35 goal season that earned him a huge payday, but he hasn't played in the preseason yet because he aggravated that beforehand. So now you could be without your second and third line center going into the season. That would be a huge question mark for me as a team that needs to get out to a hot start. Certainly would. And really quick for those who are longtime listeners of the podcast, can we get an update on the Pinto Caulfield goal ticker? Yeah, it's actually probably not as lopsided as many would think um, because Caulfield (laughs) can't play a full season. So it's uh, it's very interesting to to track that. And I believe the tweet said more complete player. And uh, if we want to look, I think it's pretty (laughs) chilly up in Caulfield's neck of the woods, but um, no, all that to say, it is something that I'll stand by. I I think Shane Pinto is a heck of a player. Those two played on the same team once. And uh, that was at the world juniors where Shane Pinto was named uh, the best forward at the tournament. And they were one, two in Hobie Baker voting where uh, Caulfield got the edge on him there. So uh, anything to spark the Sens Habs rivalry, I'm all for it. And that's just one way uh, that I like to do that. Otherwise, showing them uh, who went third and who went fourth in 2018 uh, with uh, Jesperi Kotkaniemi going one pick before Brady Kachuk. But enough of the rivalry, you know, discourse. I feel like we do still have to get in to the Montreal Canadiens. We have to get in to the Capitals, the Detroit Red Wings, who took Alex to bring it off the Senators' hands this offseason. That's all next. You're listening to a bonus season preview edition of the Locked On NHL podcast. And, uh, 
Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Snap into the NFL season with FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options. You can bet on the spreads, player props, over-unders, and more with the NHL season just around the corner. You can obviously bet on that as well. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season and the NHL season. Heck, the NBA season. You got the MLB playoffs as well. FanDuel, official partner of the Locked On Network and the NFL. Welcome back to the Locked On NHL podcast bonus season preview edition where we're hearing from all local experts on the biggest stories surrounding every team in the Eastern Conference. A reminder that you can like and subscribe to any of the Locked On NHL YouTube channels Monday to Friday, five days a week. We got you covered on each and every team and each and every historical milestone. And at this point, it feels like the Washington Capitals mostly exist to just help Alex Ovechkin beat Wayne Gretzky's all-time goals record. But of course, there's a future beyond Ovechkin that the Caps need to lay some groundwork for as well. Will new head coach Spencer Carberry succeed in doing so with a younger cast of Caps around Ovi? Dan Holmey of Locked On Capitals has more on that. And, and what is it that he brings to the table that's going to be different from the philosophy we saw last year, for example? Uh, the biggest thing uh, is that I think there is a mandate to win a Stanley Cup, of course, but also to finally bring along a lot of the youth uh, that the previous coaches before him did not. Peter Laviolette and Barry Trotz and Reardon, uh, there was some reluctance to bring along some of the young players. And we know that Spencer Carberry has a rapport being that he was the head coach of the Hershey Bears and the ECHL Stingrays as well. It's going to be interesting. Spencer Carberry is a guy I know very well, spent the last couple of seasons with the the Toronto Maple Leafs. He's a a brilliant offensive mind. He really helped bring that power play to life in Toronto the last couple of seasons, being ranked first his first year in the with the team, second uh, last season. So I'd imagine he'll bring you know that same offensive mindset to the Washington Capitals. And when you got a guy like Alex Ovechkin on that team, it definitely is. Uh, well, uh, let's just say an offensively driven coach, probably a good a good. Thing to have here 72 goals by the way separate Alex Ovechkin who is second on the NHL's all-time list with Wayne Gretzky 72 goals I say he does it hot take I've been saying that for like five years though to be fair I've been on the Ovi train forever and he just keeps on chugging I mean he's not do it this year but no. he will do it for sure he had 42 goals this past season so two more like that and he's got it in the bag. 50 goals, not this year, but last. This guy can still put the puck in the back of the net. But how much will that cost the Capitals? I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it feels like they spend so much time trying to tee him up on the power play. We know it's still an elite weapon, his his one-timer from, from that Ovechkin circle. But I feel like it's it's one of those things where everybody knows it's coming, and now 10 years in, they're 15 years in, 18 years in, they're starting to be able to stop it. Still can't stop it. Still can't stop it, though. Uh, speaking of can't stop, you can't stop Alex Debrinkit running off about your uh, your old beloved Ottawa Senators. He was one of the biggest names on the move this summer with the Red Wings landing the former 40-goal scorer from the Ottawa Senators, a move that seemed to signal uh, it was go time for the Red Wings. They'll look to kind of get out of this long, long rebuild and try and be one of those teams to make the playoffs. Uh, to break it should help on that end. But for Brian Fisher, it's former Calder winner Mo Sider who holds the keys to unlocking the Iser plan's grand vision for the Red Wings. Who figures to be the most important player on the Red Wings this year and what makes him so crucial to the team's success? So there are, again, I'm going to cheat a little bit. Obviously, again, Alex to break it uh, because again, like I said, goal scoring was a huge thing. If you can get between 35 to 40 goals, then it's going to be a huge success for the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, you lost Dominic Kubelik in that trade. Um, so that's 20 goals that he had last year that, you know, Alex to going to need to step up and then re replicate as well. But if I'm going to go defensive side of things, I would say more it's cider too, because he is the backbone of the defensive core right now. You need him as great as he was in his rookie year. Struggled a little bit early in his sophomore season before figuring it out and being great again in the second half of 
uh, the 2022 season, he needs to take another step forward in his development. He needs to become, not that he isn't already, but he needs to consistently become that number one defenseman. And I would almost argue a star defenseman in this league. There's not a lot of really, really, really good two-way defensemen left in the NHL anymore. A lot of the NHL defensemen that get a lot of the hype are like your Cam Cars and your Adam Foxes, guys who put up a lot of points. Rasmus Dahlin, again, to go back to the Buffalo Sabres. But Moritz Sider can do it both. You know, in his rookie season, he put up 50 points. If he can put up north of 50 points, but also be this stellar defenseman in the in the back end like he has been the last two years, then, I mean, that's a win. So that's why I think, to answer the question, as much as Alex Dabrinkit is, is, is a need on the offense, Moritz Sider becoming the star defenseman this team so desperately needs is is also a huge uh, need as well. I'm a huge fan of Moritz Sider. I think he's going to take another step forward. It feels like they finally found a proper pairing for him with Jake Wallman on the other side. That that typical, you know, st- more stay at home and a guy who can just kind of, you know, allow Sider to think a little bit more freely than, say, when he's playing with Ben Sherratt. Yeah, and, you know, they picked up a couple other blue liners too. Jeff Petrie, Justin Hall, Shane Gossesbear. I always forget that he signed there this offseason. So they kind of revamped that blue line with some veterans, which is an interesting thing to see, uh, you know, this young team doing. And uh, we'll see if it works and and pays off for uh, the Red Wings. Yeah, it'll be really interesting, but I think we mentioned it going in. Like, this team's going to hinge on what kind of offensive production they can get, not only from Alex Dabrinkit, but is Dylan Larkin an elite number one center in the league, or is he a very good number one center? Because I think... Very good. I'll answer that question for you. Very well, good. It, it, I think somebody who's, you know, wearing a Dylan Larkin jersey could say he's, he's never had an opportunity to play with that elite talent that now he's going to get the chance to do with the brinket. So I'm, I'm curious to see what the ceiling is. I, I've been, you know, the ire of Red Wings Twitter a lot this off season, having a little fun with the Alex to brinket. Cause I even heard you say it in the intro, Mikey, former 40 goal scorer. I mean, I only saw him score 27 and in 35 losses, one goal, one goal in 35 regulation losses that the Senators suffered last year when he scored, they won but he scored in 24 games out of 82. So it's how consistent can Dabrinkit be at putting the puck in the back of the net? If the answer is, hey, he just needed to go home and, and he can be a plus 40 goal scorer again, then this team could take a huge step in the right direction. That might not be a good step for your sense then. I mean, well, it's he's, also, he's now going to score zero goals for them this year. Could be yeah. some losses. But yeah. uh, anyways, Um you certainly can't call the Columbus Blue Jackets a boring team, though. Uh, they had an interesting offseason, to say the least. Um, they made the biggest coaching splash in probably a long time, hiring Mike Babcock, only to fire Mike Babcock about uh, a couple of days before training camp started. But as Jay Foster of the Lockdown Blue Jackets outlines, don't let the Babcock mess distract the biggest story of the Jackets summer. Lucking into Adam Fantilli, big time prospect, dropping to them at number three on draft night. Maybe hoping for a big season out of him. Here's Jay. What do you think was the team's most significant offseason move and why? And and let's keep away from coaching, I guess, for this question. Yeah, I actually um the co- I don't think that the coaching has kind of been the biggest impact. Um, I think for me, the biggest impact has to be Adam Fantilli. The Blue Jackets have a legitimate number one center for the first time maybe in franchise history uh you know like you'd argue that it was Dubois for a minute you could argue that it was Ryan Johansson for a minute Fantilli is better than both of those players I think and somehow he fell to third overall he would go first overall in basically any draft of the last 10 years apart from McDavid and Matthews he's he is good he is next level good he's not kind of Bedard but very few people are, you know, so uh, to get him at third is unbelievable. He solidifies this team down the middle. He gives them uh, yet another strong top six player uh, to mix in with that youth, like Ken Johnson, like Karel Marchenko, both had excellent rookie seasons. Um, and I think Adam Adam Fantilli, I'm uh, booking him in for 30 goals, 30 assists, a 60-point season. I think he's going to challenge for the Calder. Let's go challenging for the Calder. That's Jay Forster of Locked On Columbus Blue Jackets. Follow and like that show wherever you download your podcast as well. Mike, I'm taking Connor Bernard against the field, but hey, yeah. knock on wood, that's, that's barring a full season of health. We wish we got that from Connor McDavid, who missed half his rookie season after that. But Brendan Manning, the only reason I know that name, took out the collarbone. But uh, outside of health, I don't know how it's not Bedard's, but man, 
Fantilli made a huge impact in rookie camp. Looks like he and Patrick Laine developing some chemistry on and off the ice. I think they're roommates, if I'm not mistaken. So could that top line with Johnny Goodrow make for some wins in Columbus? I'm taking I'm taking the over in Columbus. Like they're not slated to be a terrific team. You look over on FanDuel, they're somewhere in the mid 70s. Last I checked, I am taking the over. I think this is a team that might be able to be, you know, surprise some teams and and be a bit more competitive. Uh, you know, they got to put the Babcock stuff behind them, and uh, you know, we've heard them say they want to rally around it and use it as a you know a stepping stone into having a good season. We'll see. They definitely have improved that blue line. Can Merzlikens get back to being the goaltender he was when he first came onto the scene uh, pre-pandemic? That's going to be a big question mark for the Blue Jackets, I believe. And if they can get some good goaltending, I think if Goudreau settles in, you get Line A going, there's some pieces. This team could make some noise and maybe be a surprise uh, you know, playoff contender. Not going to quite go ahead and say cup contender, but I think they could contend for the playoffs. They'll be in the mix there with the Ottawa's, Detroit's, and Buffalo's, I think. That's your hottest take of the day, Mike, but I'll let yeah. you have it. Now, a team that's looking to get out of the rebuild to one that's really in the middle of it. Chuck Fletcher out. Keith Jones, Danny Briere in. In Philadelphia, Rachel Donner of Locked On Flyers says the new direction is a much welcome sight in Philly. Obviously, uh, some big changes in leadership for the Philadelphia Flyers uh, this season. So was that the biggest move? of the off season for the flyers or were there other things that could potentially fall into that category? Yeah, I'd say that's the biggest meta move that the team made, obviously hiring Keith Jones as team president and Danny Breer as GM, both former flyers uh, familiar with the team culture and uh, ushering in, according to their marketing department, a new era of orange for the team. Um, and I think as far as, you know, more significant moves that they've made. Um, I think they did sort of establish a new tone for what they're trying to do with the organization. And I think the two biggest moves were trading Ivan Provorov away. I think, you know, when you trade your number one defenseman away, uh, you signal the rebuild. The, the big R word is actually here and they're not afraid to say it. And, you know, they got some significant assets in return. Now they had to take some salary cap dump in order to do it. But we got a second uh, first round draft pick this past year, which is huge for the Flyers. And um, I think the other big move was in that draft, drafting Matvey Mitchkoff. I think that it's a, a pick that past Flyers regimes would not have done, would not have taken that risk. Uh, but the reward potential is so high for a high-end player like him and a, a dynamic forward like him. And uh, given the, the rebuild status, it, it's an easy choice because we got the time to wait for him. That's Rachel Donner, Locked On Flyers. Find them wherever you download your podcast. Mike, this is going to be a season full of watching Matt Vemichkov highlights from the KHL for Flyers fans. Probably. I would say that'll be something that would be one of their things that they should be looking forward to the most i'm just looking eight games so far this year 10 points already through eight games uh he, you know he's with sochi now um so hey kudos to uh to to matt bay Michkov. hopefully he can turn out a pretty good season for them but you know this is this is not going to be a fun season for flyers fans and i know, you know they've got an entertaining head coach who doesn't he's not going to tank he's going to try and win every single game and john tortorella but this just is not a roster that's going to compete most nights. They're getting Couturier should be returning from his injury, missed all of last season. Uh, you know, I think there should possibly be some guys like Joel Farabee, Frost, Tippett, who could take, you know, another bit of a next step here. But ultimately, yeah, this is just going to be, a, 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 you know, it's a start of a rebuild. New management, probably going to see some other guys leave. Scott Lawton, maybe. Travis Konechny could be on the trade block at some point, Sanheim. So it's going to be a, a down year for most Flyers fans, I'd assume. Yeah, it certainly will. And a lot of Habs fans wanted to take Matthew Michkov at fifth overall. They end up taking taking David Reinbacker. Michkov goes seventh to the Philadelphia Flyers. But the Habs made what I believe is a wise decision, sending Reinbacker back to Switzerland for another year, not rushing their star defensive prospect. And, that, to me, symbolizes that 
the rebuild is still well in its depths. They are still in the draft and development stage. No surprise there. The first team in NHL history to finish 32nd overall in the Seattle Kraken's first season. They took a mini step forward, but with Slavkovsky, their first overall pick in 2022, missing much of the year with injury. They're hoping for a full season of health from him and many others as the Habs were near, if not at the top of the NHL in man games lost after last season. Scott Matlove, Locked On Canadian, says a veteran D-man will have an outsized importance for a team looking to make small steps forward this season. Who figures to be the most important player on the Canadiens this season and what makes him so crucial to the team's success? I know people are going to expect me to say Nick Suzuki here. He's the captain. He's the leading point getter. He makes that engine run. And other people might expect me to say Cole Caulfield because he is the star scoring winger. And to those people, I would say, yes, you are both correct. I'm going to go off board and I'm going to say the most important player to the team this season is going to be defenseman Mike Matheson. When he was in the lineup last year, the offense ran smoother. Breakouts were smoother. Defensive zone coverage was smoother. The puck moved better there. He makes that defense click and he gets that offense started. If he is healthy and in the lineup for hopefully this entire season this year, I think you're going to see a lot more polish on the Canadian side of things there. And you're going to see points rise all across the team because he is able to start so many plays with the puck on his stick in his own end of the ice. Who better to comment on the Montreal Canadiens than the hosts of Locked On Senators and Locked On Toronto Maple Leafs? But honestly, <laughs> what would be a successful season for the Habs, you think? Uh, well, healthy. I think if they can all stay healthy, Cole Caulfield especially, get through a full 82 or 80 at the very least, pot himself 40, 45 goals. I think Yuri Slavkovsky getting a full season out of him. Can he take some positive steps after going number one overall a year ago? I think those two players, you just want to see them continue to progress. That would probably be it for me. Can some of those young blue liners also kind of start to take those next steps? There's high praise for, you know, Caden Gooley apparently looking pretty good in, in camp. Can he continue it on to the season? Arbor Jack, I saw him playing the other day against the Maple Leafs. I know he's mostly known for punching dudes in the face, but he's actually a decent defenseman. You know, he's got some uh, weirdly has some offensive instincts in him as well. Um, jumping up into some rushes and getting some shots off. So uh, I think just it's going to be a year of, of, you know, some of these young guys hopefully progressing. That's what they want uh, out of this Marty St. Louis led team. And lastly, we come to maybe the quietest team in the East over the course of the off season. And really it's the Lou Lamorello cone of silence. It's the New York Islanders. Gil Martin details the challenge for a roster that's already been assembled by Lou. Do more with the same. Let's start with the biggest storyline surrounding the New York Islanders heading into this season. I think the biggest storyline is that the cast is the same, and now it's a question of whether or not the same group of players can get better results. Now, the Islanders themselves, the players, the organization, they're saying, well, it's not exactly the same. We had Bo Horvat only for February till the end of the year. Uh, Pierre Engvall, we only had from the trade deadline to the end of the year. Now we've got these guys for a full season. Matthew Barzal is healthy again. Um, so they're they're sort of playing it up that way. But essentially, Lou Lamorello is bringing back the same cast and hoping for a better result. I don't think they're going to see it, Rossi. I just oh. don't see it happening. Great goalie. Great goal, Tiny, who can steal some games for them. If they do make the playoffs, it's on the back of Ilya Sorokin. But there's just not enough goals to be found in this lineup, in my opinion. I agree. And I also think that goaltending wins championships, though, and he's so good, Sorokin, that he could will this team to be in that mix for the final playoffs. But they're definitely going to finish higher than Columbus. And if you no. want to take this offline... I would like to go to FanDuel and I'd like to go to your house and pick out everything that I want and then we can make a wager on it. All right. We'll we'll talk off screen. We'll talk right. off screen. I, I I have better hopes in Columbus than I do for uh, for the Islanders. Can we also just remember that this offseason Lou Lamorello gave Pierre Engvall a seven year contract? 
Oh, I'm you, not you worried about the long-term this. future. I think this upcoming season, I think he helps them out in terms of being a little faster. That was always the thing with the Islanders. They were aging, and they weren't necessarily the quickest team. So at least he brings that element of speed. Seven years, I'm with you. It's it's a wild term. And they gave out term like candy this offseason but uh, at Halloween. But, I mean, they, they're a team that I still think can be that that not, uh, eight to ten in the Eastern Conference. They're They're just as average as humanly possible. Yeah, that's probably a pretty good way to to put it. I think they're in the same mix as as the Jackets, right? They're, they're going to compete for a wild card spot, but ultimately uh, probably miss out. Heading in completely different directions long term. I will uh, tip my hat and agree to you there. And that will do it for this special presentation for Locked On NHL. For more on every team in the East and the entire National Hockey League ahead of the new NHL season, be sure to tune into the local Locked On podcast covering your team the way only our local experts can throughout the season. The Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.